Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. Today we are going to design the overcurrent protection for the electronic load project. This circuit is responsible for keeping the load within its limits, and by that I mean the transistor on the output, even during fault conditions. That is a pretty big ask. It's also responsible for making sure we keep our FET within that safe operating area, and it's going to be burning up to 300 watts most of the time. So that sounds awesome. That sounds important. Let's dive in. The first thing that we need to do is choose a compensator architecture. We've left this kind of up in the air. And honestly, we probably should have talked about that more by now. And I had to dive in a little bit to build the general framework to kind of set the stage for this overcurrent protection. And I'm going to show you exactly why we needed to do that. This might be a bit much to take in. This is kind of a lot. This is what you are seeing. Um, this looks quite similar to what we've been talking about before, but with a slight tweak. Um, it's still basically what I had to do is I had to think about the logic, like the polarity of the logic signals that we have and how to minimize the number of op amps. So what you'll see up here is the same PID type of configuration that you would expect with the summing amplifier. But I basically made all of these things the inverting type. And then we made an inverting summing amplifier. So we basically double invert the signal. And what that allows us to do is get rid of that extra gain stage on the D term and uh, simplify the integrator, simplify. Well, yeah, it simplifies the integrator, simplifies the differentiator, and um, reduces the number of op amps required. Uh, what we see in this region of the screen is the OCP circuit. Uh, or sorry, yeah, the OCP, the overcurrent protection circuit. And then down here, you see the voltage buffer with some of that other circuitry we're going to talk about in a moment. So by and large, it looks quite similar. You'll even see that we've implemented that output transistor pair from the previous video. So this is starting to look quite like what I expect our electronic load to the simulation is being built up piece by piece, a little more complexity here and there, and let's talk about how the overcurrent protection links in. We will be talking about tuning the compensator and why we decided to stick with the PID. I've made that decision, we just don't really have enough time to cover both of those in one video, so stay tuned, get subscribed, make sure you don't miss it, it will be cool. And there's two critical parts of this, right? There's the voltage coming in, which is coming from our current shunt. And for something like overcurrent protection, absolute accuracy isn't really the most important thing. The most important thing ends up being um, the absolute maximum bound of that overcurrent protection. And if you can have a bunch of variability in there, but your minimum trip throw, <laughs> but your minimum trip threshold is above what you would ever expect to see, and your maximum trip threshold is below the maximum for the MOSFET, it's no problem. It can be a little sloppy. It that's fine. It's not really what we're regulating to. And I'm saying that for a reason. Basically, as a part of minimizing the amount of transistors required, I did a little bit of simplification. I turned our gain stage and the error amplifier into one thing. And that's a problem for our overcurrent protection because that means it does not get the benefit of that amplification. That is, the input offset error of our comparator is going to have a magnitude four, five times larger than it would have after this amplification stage, but it eliminates an op amp. This is a trade-off. This was a design compromise. And so what that means is this VI sense becomes very important. So what I did is I increased the resistance of our sense resistor just a little bit. I increased that just a little bit to increase the voltage present here. However, so that's 0.2 ohms on the shunt and coming back over to our reference. Why is that important? Because our reference is going to directly set our trip current threshold. We're using a two and a half volt reference here. The one we're actually using is programmable, so it's got a third tap that comes off and you can kind of tweak that set point. But there's one problem with a two and a half volt reference. V equals I times R, 0.05 ohms. That is a 50 amp current limit. That is a little more than we were hoping for. 
So what are we going to do? You can already see it on the screen, right? We've got a, a resistor divider here. And basically what we have set this trip threshold to is nominally 14.29 amps, 0.714 volts. Honestly, probably could have just used a forward bias diode, but I wanted something a little more accurate than that. The reason why I decided to use this two and a half volt reference, we used a programmable one, is because it's a really cheap part. It's 1% accurate. I think, no, it's 0.1, so the 0.1 or 0.5% accurate. I don't remember which one we picked, but they're footprint compatible. You can swap on whatever you need. Two and a half volt reference that's programmable. We can use that to buy a BJT and build a basic LDO. We can use that with a set of resistors to make it output more than two and a half volts. We can do a lot of things with that reference. And I think that if we need a reference in multiple parts of this design, we'll be able to use that same part which will help us to reduce cost and just have less parts laying around the shop. Like using parts that are versatile has value. And I intend to do exactly that. I'm not just thinking about this design. I'm thinking about the designs that are to come and where this design is going. It's important to keep in mind what you have designed and what you will design as you continue to design. If you do everything in a vacuum, you might end up with something that's a little more expensive or not as Great. Anyways, that was a bit of a tangent. So you had a series resistor. It's basically like a temperature compensated zener that has different voltage levels, more accurate than a zener for sure. You're gonna kind of gloss over the comparator because the comparator is one of the simplest parts of this architecture. Basically, it looks at the reference versus the current uh, input. And if the current is too high, it will turn on the output. In this case, because of the way that we've configured it, the iSense comes in on the negative terminal. So whenever iSense is greater than the reference, it will output logic level zero, or in this case, that's ground. And when the opposite is true, it will output 15 volts because of how we have configured the output. When the output of this comparator is ground, so as we're pulling current through the PNP transistor, that will push current through the NPN transistor, which will pull current through this PNP transistor, which will dump current through this R15, putting a voltage across M2, and that will clamp the output to ground. Wow, that is a lot of transistors. Why do I love transistors so much? Well, let's think about this. Okay, our current shunt is measured with respect to ground. Our transistor is being driven with respect to positive and minus 15 volts when I want to clamp that transistor off as hard as possible, driving it to negative 15 volts, which is the limit of our particular MOSFET, will make sure that we're driving through that zero volt off position as fast as possible. So if this part is able, able to drive between 15 volts and ground, and this FET is driven with respect to minus 15 volts, no matter what our comparator is doing, there's either going to be 15 volts or 30 volts applied to the gate of our FET. So it will always be on and sometimes be damaged because that can handle a maximum of 15 volts at the gate. So what are we doing here? Basically, to get through that DC offset, we're using current controlled devices instead of voltage controlled devices. And we are translating this 0 to 15 volt signal into a ground to negative 15 volt signal. That's what we've just done. But in order to do that effectively, and in order to drive this MOSFET as fast as possible, we're using this to drive current, and then this set of transistors is really doing most of the heavy lifting. Hopefully, hopefully I explained that well enough. It's just BJTs turning on BJTs, turning on BJTs, turning on a MOSFET. There's probably a simpler way to do that. But the way that I see it is that adding these extra transistors is allowing us to leverage their current gain. And using current gain three times driving a voltage controlled device is going to make that pretty much as snappy as possible. I expect that maybe a volt, like when that first transistor, when this first transistor is barely on, 
I would expect the current gain downstream to snap the MOSFET on almost immediately. And I think that's going to be pretty great. I think that will make this respond a little bit faster than it would otherwise. If this turns out to be exuberantly expensive, if this turns out to be excessively expensive and just completely overcomplicated and not work half the time, I think we can pull some of these transistors out of the design. But just for a moment, I want to entertain keeping it like this. And that's about all I can say without kicking the tires on this design. We should see some nice voltage transients. All right, what are we applying to the load? We're applying a almost zero volt up to 90 volts. We are basically going from almost nothing, almost no voltage in, to the maximum allowed for our design. And what is our reference demanding? Uh, we are demanding between, what is that? 10 amps. So basically, we're stretching it from minimum current to maximum current while we're going from maximum voltage to minimum voltage. Or in other words, we are going to be pushing this design beyond its limits. Because remember, there's a 300 watt limit for the FET. We're going to be burning more than that because 90 times 10 is 900 watts or three times what this thing is designed for. That's all right, though. This is a simulation where thermals don't happen. Oops, I hit run again. Sorry about that. We'll jump ahead. Okay. So let's look at the current through this load. Ah, yes. We see some healthy, healthy current transients up to 40 amps. Now, that's more than we had intended. I believe this is designed for... I think 25 amps for up to a millisecond. Let's look at what this exposes our FET to. This exposes our FET to... We're going to use a rectangular approximation here. It exposes it to 40 amps, just under 40 amps, for one and a half microseconds. I've got the safe operating area curve here. The one on the right is the one that is important because that is while the part is hot. It should be slightly reduced. And if we look at the 25 microsecond curve, 25 microsecond curve, when there is 90 volts across, and that is the maximum because that's what we're applying, there should be an over voltage protection that protects it beyond that. Okay, so the 100 volts applied, 25 microseconds, that's well within the safe operating area. That pulse could be about well, 10 times longer, and we would still be okay. As long as it's only one pulse, and it should be, because we've got a programmable fault retry timer with that RC time constant. So for as long as we need it to hold that off, we can reprogram that restart interval to prevent it from building up too much heat and blowing up our part. Cool. So that overcurrent protection, as long as the over voltage protection is also working, should keep our part within the safe operating area limit with a ton of margin. That is phenomenal. On the, oh, the integrator term. The integrator term, how could I forget about the integrator term? That was one of the big issues in our previous design. Basically, the integrator didn't completely reset. And you can see from the way that this is behaving, you can see from this beautiful transient response, it looks just like we had turned it on for the first time. I found a way to completely reset the integrator. And basically, rather than set the set point to zero amps, I set the set point to negative 15 amps, or no, negative 15 volts worth of amps, which is a lot. I set it to negative a lot, which resets the integrator completely. And then when we come back around, it'll turn on more normally. So that, that was good. That was a change. So before we were clamping it to zero, now we're clamping it to negative 15 volts and that allows for turning on as one would expect. Uh, to demonstrate that, I will just show the error out. You see there's that big negative 15 volt spike on the error amp, and then if I find the integrator, if I find the integrator, if I find the integrator, <laughs> I'm just joking, um, we can add the I term, and you can see the I term becomes negative 
or sorry, the I term becomes inverted. Inverted, negative is normal, positive is abnormal. It becomes positive 15. So basically, whoo, completely reset the integrator, and then it comes back. Um, the output of this amplifier looks a lot like that. So that's the output of the whole PID controller. That's what's being passed to the gate of our FET. Fantastic. Well, that's all I have for today. But I hope that you like this video. I hope that you like our overcurrent protection design. I hope that you like that we're going to keep our FET within its safe operating area limit. And if you did, if you like this video and can't wait for more, let us know by hitting that like button, getting subscribed, or leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we'll be adding over voltage protection to complement this overcurrent protection and finalize the compensation network design. We're going to tune that a little bit. Make sure that PID is the right architecture for us. And if it's not, we'll switch to something else. I can't wait. I'm super excited. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out the links in the description of this video. Down there, you'll find a link to this simulation as well as our Patreon page. I just want to say thank you to those that have reached out and uh, decided to become a patron and support us through that way. You're a big part of keeping this all possible. Thank you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thank you for watching EE for everyone, and thanks for staying till the end. Bye!